All right, folks, let's get into this. This is the Feminist Perspectives chapter from Cell Now. And uh, yes, this is English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Martin. And this is one of the mo probably the most, uh, one of the most, maybe the most, I might go so far as to say the most popular perspective. You know, a lot of students really uh, enjoy working with this. And it's uh, not so much as, the <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily the easiest one. There's, there's quite a bit of terminology here. Uh, but I think what makes it appealing is that it's, you know, just, just the real world uh, implications of this are so easy to see. And, it uh, you know, people feel like it applies to them in ways that some of those other perspectives are a little bit more abstract, I suppose, and more, uh, you know, ivory tower type stuff. Uh, with the neo-Marxism in, in this chapter in particular, I think, really hit home to a lot of people. Uh, so, but anyway, let's, let's dive into it. Uh, so we'll be discussing, get my pointer here, uh, the terminology, of course, uh, words like hegemony, patriarchy, masculine hegemony, and uh, heteronormativity, uh, quite a few syllables there. And I'll just say this, uh, this chapter really uh, borrows or kind of moves from the neo-Marxism chapter. Uh, so you might want to go back and review that chapter again or rewatch the lecture I did on that because, again, this lecture will build on a lot of the same, same concepts. So it might behoove you to uh, review a little bit. Yeah. I'll try to uh, give you a quick recap here, but, you know, if it's not making sense, you know, maybe go back and, and watch that lecture again and then come back. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll talk about these terms. We'll get into the steps of conducting an analysis using a feminist perspective. And then we'll look at some sample, the sample essays in the back of the, uh, collect, or the chapter, and you can see how this stuff can be applied. All right, so to start us off, though, I want you to rewatch this scene. It's a, it's a good scene. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of people write about this scene in their essays, rhetorical analysis essays. But take a look at it for now. We're not going to write a full essay. <laughs> uh, it starts around the 35-minute mark. I think it starts with uh, Shane and Curl. Uh, they're in the river looking for uh, frogs. You know, as the title of the episode uh, has it. Uh, but anyway, just, just watch it. Listen to the dialogue uh, that happens with the women, you know, the confrontation. Uh, there and ask yourself what you think about the characters. Who are the models or the characters that we're supposed to want to be like? And who are the anti-models or the characters who are we're not, we do not want to be like, we find reprehensible, disgusting somehow? With respect to the quote-unquote appropriate roles and behavior for men and women. And so take a look at that scene again and answer the question and then we will move forward. All right, uh, so what is a feminist perspective? Uh, so a feminist perspective is one that focuses on the taken for granted as normal roles for men and women in society. Uh, so we could take pretty much any movie, pretty much any story, poem or song from just about any era, and if we look at it closely enough, we'll find it has something to say in there. Probably not stated directly, but you know it implies something about what they consider uh, normal or acceptable or appropriate uh, about how men and women should believe, behave, and, and act and get along or, <laughs> or not get along. <laughs> and so there's a lot of stuff that fits that category, right? Uh, but what we want to do is uh, add a little piece to that. And so it's not just, you know, looking at anything that has something to say about gender roles, uh, but we want to assume a, a critical rhetorical perspective. And this is a little bit more specialized because, as you can see, the word critical there uh, means there's something uh, wrong, right? There, we're going to do, uh, you know, take a hard look, <laughs> you know, at, the, at the, uh, these works. This, and when you see critical in a context like this, it's referring to the critical theory uh, that we talked about last time with the, the neo-Marxism. Uh, the idea there is that there's some kind of dominant ideology, right? There's a, a view basically what, what you would probably consider to be just common sense or traditional values, traditional ways, ways of life. Uh, they say that you just take those for granted. You don't really think about it too much. It's just kind of been, uh, you just kind of adopted them uh, because maybe you were taught that. You grew up watching certain movies and shows. You know, your, your friends <laughs> shared the view. Nobody really challenges it or thinks too much about it. Um, 
you know, that's the way these ideologies work. You just, oh, that's just the way it is. You know, just, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> uh, but if you assume a critical perspective on it, or you embrace critical theory, then you say, well, let's just hold on a minute. Uh, you know, maybe there's more to this. Maybe there's, uh, you know, these ideas that we think or the way things ought to be are actually not our ideas, but they've been sort of foisted upon us by this uh, dominant class. So the elites, the power, powers that be, um, the rulers, you know, whatever you want to, uh, to call them, you know, those, the reason that we have those, uh, these ideas is because these are the ideas that are good for them, right? They keep them in power, they keep the, those wheels turning, they keep them, uh, <laughs> you know, living in the, the life of luxury or whatever, uh, but they're not so good for everybody else. Uh, and you, the question, though, is why, why, how could that be? You know, how could there be a king, let's say, with all of these uh, peasants, and maybe there's like a thousand peasants and, and only one king? Uh, why, why don't the peasants just, uh, you know, rise up, revolt, you know, take all the king's stuff? Uh, and the idea here is, well, there's this thing called ideology or hegemony, all kinds, like the, the schools, the stories, the songs, the, the myths, um, religion, you know, plays a role. Uh, but all of these sort of cultural elements work to uh, convince these cl uh, classes, uh, the, not the dominant class or the ruling, I get the working classes, right, or the peasants in that example. Uh, they're convinced basically, you know, this is the way things are, right? And you better just obey the law, you better obey the king, uh, because you'll go to hell <laughs> uh, if you don't. Uh, so you don't want to go to hell, uh, let's say, so you don't uh, do those things. And this is a, this theory basically says that's how a lot of things work that we just take for granted. Uh, you don't really question it too much, and that's why you have to be taught this stuff. Or right, so the, the neo-Marxist says uh, you need to read Karl Marx. <laughs> you need to understand the Communist Manifesto because uh, otherwise you'll think it's just fine that you know you're living on like a starvation wage and working a very dangerous job for low pay and you know so on and so forth. Uh, and here. It's that same kind of thinking, but instead of just talking about jobs and the economy, you know, things of that sort, we're looking into gender, uh, sex, gender, sexual orientation. And, and what are these dominant ideas about these things and, and the values that are kind of part of that? And how does that play out in our lives? All right. So why do we have those views? And the critical rhetorical uh, feminist perspective says maybe we should. As a matter of fact, these could be very oppressive and restrict uh, people's freedoms in various ways and limit people and uh, you know, they can be very problematic. Uh, so we don't want to just accept all these ideas that have been handed down to us in the forms of traditions or stories or whatever and just say well that's just the way things are, that's the way things all, always have been, etc. Uh, instead you want to really give it a, again, a hard look and start questioning it, questioning it and uh, you know seeing it how well it holds up. You know, at least that's my <laughs> that's my take <laughs> on uh, what, the stuff we're talking about here. Uh, feminists, then. Uh, so remember the hegemony. Uh, this is that ideology, the dominant ideology, uh, the brainwashing, if you want to think about it that way, the manipulation, uh, however you want to uh, to frame it. And so it's out there all the time working to convince these oppressed groups that they just need to accept, you know, the way things are. It's just normal. It's just common sense. You know, <laughs> your life sucks, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, that kind of thinking. Um, and, and a feminist then says, oh, come on, you know, enough already. Uh, we're not going to just accept that anymore. Uh, these are just beliefs and actions that can be challenged, right? We don't have to just accept these uh, traditional views and you know, just because it's been around, always been that way, whatever, uh, we can uh, reject that, you know, consciously, again, thinking about it, writing about it, arguing about it, um, rejecting those views and attitudes and respecting individuals who let's see, uh, embrace and enact multiple gender styles and sexual orientations. And so this is the definition of a feminist that Sal now gives us. Uh, and briefly, I wanted to uh, talk about how you might combine some of the perspectives that we talked about with this. You know, again, this is kind of advanced stuff, but, but I just kind of enjoy thinking about how these perspectives overlap. 
And one of the ways is, uh, I want to do two just briefly, looking at Burke and his terministic screens concept, and then we'll look at the uh, symbolic convergence theory. Uh, but you remember when we talked about Kenneth Burke? I told you that he had this idea called the terministic screen, uh, part of his dramatism package, and it was a, a screen composed of terms or symbols uh, through which humans perceive the world and the direct attention away from some interpretations and towards others. A terministic screen reflects, selects, and deflects as a way of shaping the symbol systems that allow us to cope with the world. And each of these perspectives has terms, you know, terministic screen, right? Uh, that helps you see some things more clearly but blur or ignore others. Uh, so for Burke, the terms we use to talk about things, the symbols, the language, you know, if you're moving from, uh, you know, one wave of feminism to another wave of feminism, or you're switching from neo-Marxism into uh, uh, feminism, let's say, uh, Burke would say that what you're really doing there is is putting on different terministic screens. And it works kind of like these different uh, fishing glasses. If you like to fish, <laughs> you, probably, you know, I like to fish. I did not realize this. Uh, apparently, there are many different kinds of sunglasses. And each of the type of lens, you know, in these frames can help you be, uh, you know, help you fish <laughs> or see the fish, I guess, depending on the time of day and where you are and the type of uh, sunlight there that's coming through. Uh, but if you get it, I like this, uh, this graphic here because it kind of talks about when's the best use. So like this sort of green pair, you know, there's a situation, there's a context where that green pair will help you catch more fish but you wouldn't want to wear it in these other conditions, right? It might actually hurt you more than help you, depending on uh, the situation. And so I think that's a very useful way to think about these perspectives in this book. Uh, you know, a feminist perspective will certainly help you to see things having something to do with gender and sexuality and so on. But uh, it might also, at the same time, um, you know, limit you in some ways or might direct attention away from these other issues. Like, remember, the neo-Marxists would, would say, look, you've got to focus on the e economics. <laughs> it's the economy, stupid. Uh, don't, don't even look at these other issues. That's a distraction. Uh, so all of these um, perspectives, one way to think about them, again, would be as, as terministic screens. And you could say, which one's the best? Which one's the best? You know, what is the best pair of sunglasses? You know, and, and Burke would say, well, look, there's no such thing as just one pair that's going to work for every scenario. <laughs> It's so, kind of the whole point, right? You pick the one uh, that's going to be the most useful one uh, for whatever your you know particular goal is. You know, I think that's a pretty good way to look at that. Uh, and then the symbolic convergence theory and fantasy theme analysis one. You know, I see a lot of uh, overlap with that as well. Uh, in this chapter, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the waves of feminism here, uh, but one way to think about those when this chapter starts talking about like the first wave of feminism and the second wave and the third wave, uh, I thought about, okay, that's rhetorical vision. That's rhetorical visions. And they have these life cycles, right? You have the, whatever the creates the vision. There's some kind of reason like the need for vote, voting rights. Uh, they attract newcomers. Uh, it sort of comes and goes. You, you want to attract more people. If the interest starts to uh, wane, you have to do something to, uh, you know, buoy it up again, get people excited about the uh, life cycle again. Uh, but eventually the wave kind of, you know, like any wave kind of, uh, you know, goes away. In this case, if you, <laughs> you uh, when you have the right to vote, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to keep on, um, you know, staying part of that organization, right? Uh, so I thought you could, you could talk about these ways of feminism in terms of these different rhetorical visions, the you know, consciousness creating, the raising, sustaining, uh, also, the symbolic cues, uh, you think about, uh, uh, like, the, the hats, <laughs> I don't want to say the word, <laughs> you know, but there's certain uh, uh, hats uh, that people wear, and you could say, that's a symbolic cue, right? You see those hats, and you know uh, what that's all about, and it kind of lets you know right away if somebody is in on that movement or knows what it's about. Or somebody might look at the hat and say, what in the world? <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, so that's a symbolic cue, meaning it lets you know basically whether or not the person uh, is familiar with the group or an insider. 
You know, and the same for all these other uh, elements here. Remember, the founding fantasy was like the story of how did we get here? How did this group come together? And I think you even see that in this chapter, if you look closely and think about it. Really, this chapter kind of tells you about like how feminism came to be. It kind of gives you this... I know it's, fantasy is a weird word there, but it's basically just the history of the movement. All right, so enough of that. Let's uh, talk about the feminist terminology in this chapter. Uh, one of the big ones is patriarchy. And the patriarchy is the structuring of society around family units where a male is the authority figure and is responsible for the welfare of his family members and community. Uh, so I think patriarchy, the opposite of this, uh, you can think about the opposite of what, what would a opposite of a patriarchy look like. Uh, might be a society where the family units, where the, as a female, might be an authority figure and responsible. Uh, if you watch Wonder Woman, <laughs> uh, you can get, see an example of that uh, kind of society. Um, but again, this is one of those ideas that, you know, for many, many years, you know, this is just kind of, oh, well, what's, what's wrong with that? And that's just the way things are, the patriarchy, the, you know, father knows best was literally the name of, of a sitcom. I think from the 50s it was uh, referenced in this chapter. Uh, so that's just what they mean there is that, you know, the patriarchy, father knows best, right? The father, you know, he's in charge. You go to him. He's the one that's got all the knowledge. He's, he's out making the money. He's got the big job and, you know, <laughs> tells the kids what to do. <laughs> uh, that's the patriarchy. Uh, masculine hegemony describes gender and power inequities in ways that account for multiple masculinities and how hegemonic structures oppress all forms other than heterosexual masculinity. Uh, so what this one is about is kind of like coming back to that idea of what's appropriate roles, or what's appropriate behavior. You know, there's certain ways that, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, someone who might say, well, that's very manly. You know, this uh, th such and such a person is very manly, but this this other person is, you know, I think I, I don't want to get into the stereotypes <laughs> even in an example, but you know, let's just say you said that that other person doesn't really strike me as very being very manly. Um, you know, that's the sort of ideas there, right? There's well, who gets to say that? You know, uh, where does this where's this coming from? And again, according to this theory, it's coming from the hegemony. Right? It's just sort of top down and sort of foisted upon people, and people just uh, adopt it without really being even conscious of it, much less being critical of it. Uh, so part of this job, I guess, if you want to uh, analyze masculine hegemony is get in there and start breaking it down and saying, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. You know, there's plenty of other forms of masculinity than just this little narrow macho sort of thing. Uh, heteronormativity, uh, this is the privileging of heterosexuality in an alignment among biological sex, sexuality, gender identity, and gender roles. And if you look at this word normativity, you kind of see the word norm, normal, kind of buried in that word somewhere. Uh, you know, and that's the idea there, I think, is that, you know, for so many generations, for so many years, it's this kind of this view of this is what's normal, uh, the, the heterosexuality, this, this sort of alignment, is watch just common sense, and anything that doesn't fit that model must be somehow not normal, right? strange, odd, you know, something like that. Uh, so this is where, uh, <coughs> you know, a critic comes in again and says, this is actually not just common sense or the way things have to be. Uh, we could actually get in here and question these things and say, you know, maybe this, this business about this stuff being aligned is, is wrong. You know, it's just we've been sort of normalized or sort of conditioned, I guess, uh, into seeing things a certain way, uh, when really it doesn't have to be that way. Okay, so that brings us to sites of struggle. And again, I don't want to keep repeating this, but <laughs> you know, we talked about this in the Neo-Marxism, Neo-Marxist chapter as well. Uh, but remember when we said the, uh, we talked about neo marx and I said that the neo meant like a new Marxism, like the updated updated version. Uh, the old version of that 
of Marxism just said ideology is just the brain. Everybody that's not a Marxist basically is, is suffering from ideology or false consciousness, right? They've been sort of brainwashed. And if we could just sort of wake them up, they would become a, a Marxist. Uh, the neo-Marxist, though, said so that's a little bit simplistic, uh, that view. You know, there, there's you can't. There's no. Uh, there's nobody out there that's not that has no ideology. You know, just like Burke would say, nobody doesn't have a deterministic screen and just seeing things as they are. Uh, it's just a matter of which deterministic screen are you using in any particular situation. Uh, so the sites of struggle uh, kind of gets at that idea. So instead of just saying you're either ideolo ideological or you're not, it's saying actually there's all these different ideologies out there and they're competing. Uh, there's one that's sort of on top. The most powerful one is called the dominant ideology or the hegemony. But people aren't just okay with it. Uh, there are a lot of people that are fighting it and trying to challenge it, question it, uh, you know, putting songs out there, let's say a protest song. Uh, you, could sit, you, could, you could sit down and write a scathing uh, protest song and put it on the radio and you know, the, rage against the machine, right? You, you could be raging against the machine. <laughs> say, uh, say it's, it's not like everybody's just okay with you know the hegemony. Um, it's a side of struggle. Now some of these taken for granted beliefs, and I was thinking maybe cannibalism. I, I think it's safe to say this that nobody think nobody is saying well cannibalism is actually okay. <laughs> I don't think anybody would argue that. Uh, that is just kind of accepted by everyone. So I would say that this is not a side of struggle here. Um, there's, nobody's really struggling or arguing about about that, but there's plenty of other elements in culture and society that, even though they might have been, you know, part of the, the hegemony for many hundreds of years, even uh, they're still shifting, or now they're shifting. Uh, now there's debate, and these can come and go. Sometimes the debates fire up. Sometimes they die back down. You know, we could, we could go all the way back to that rhetorical vision uh, life cycle with some of these things. Um, but like the, the public restrooms, they talk about this in the chapter a little bit. It's like a little sidebar about it. Uh, but you might, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's some debate about this idea that the bathroom or the restroom, like you should have men and women. And, you know, some people, it's becoming a you know movement. I, I don't know exactly where it fits into our rhetorical vision life cycle at the moment. But it seems to be somewhere like maybe here or here. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, in St. Cloud State, uh, there's been some debate about this uh, recently. Uh, but these are things, again, they're subject to change. Uh, there's a reason to get involved in the debate. And, you know, you, you have a point, you have an opinion. And it's something that could, you know, affect society. All right, and then readings. Uh, again, this is one of those weird terms. I don't know why they call it this, but we, we talked about how any sitcom, a pop culture, really you could say even like this sign here, uh, the all-gender restroom, uh, you could say that's a reading, uh, or there's a reading there. You say, what, what does that mean? And you say, well, it's got something to say about the way things are, or the way things should be. It's got this sort of ideological argument. It's implicit within the uh, artifact. So we could say this little sign here, you could say this is a an artifact, cultural artifact, and if we really dig into it, uh, we could say it's kind of making a, it's taking a sort of position on an issue, a side of struggle, right, it's part of this side of struggle, and it's got a, a case that it's trying to make, kind of a, just assuming things, um, obviously it's just a sign, <laughs> you know, but you could take that same concept, and you know, there could be a whole movie uh, that could be, a, you know, making a, a whole movie could be a reading, um, so it's making some kind of argument again, and you have to uh, analyze it. It might not be obvious what it's saying about that issue. And we have to do the analysis. We have to, uh, you know, put the terms in there, mix it up, <laughs> shake it up, filter it, and see what comes out. And then we could figure out what the reading is. Um, and the readings come in different categories. The preferred reading means it supports the status quo. Uh, and those can be either blatant, so it's obvious, doesn't try to hide anything, uh, so that's kind of like propaganda, uh, or it could be occluded so that at first it seems like, yeah, it's opposed to the hegemony, 
but then when you dive a little bit deeper in really start to look at it you find out no it actually is just that preferred again it just seemed like it was saying something different uh, or you can have oppositional and which again this is the one that opposes the status quo so i mentioned rage against the machine a while ago you know so you rage against the machine you know <laughs> f you <laughs> i won't do what you tell me right you know, that, that sounds pretty oppositional you know it doesn't sound like those guys want to do what they're being told <laughs> to me <laughs> so you can see that seems like it's an oppositional reading in that song uh, but then you can get into this you can say, well, is it in inflected or subverted? Now, if it's inflected, you're saying, well, you do oppose it to a certain degree, but usually it's uh, to, to, uh, to the degree that I'm not included in it. Because you know, say if we, if we could open it up a little bit and be more inclusive with it, then it would be okay. Uh, so it's not like we just need to tear the whole thing down. We just need to, uh, you know, increase the opportunities, let's say. And you call that inflected. Uh, sort of bending the rules rather than breaking them altogether, just getting away or doing away with the rule. Or you could say it's, it's subverted or it's subversive. All right, so this would, you know, I'd have, I'd have to sit down with like Rage Against the Machine, <laughs> you know, and really study to say for sure whether it's subversive. You know, are they really saying we need to just do away with all of the uh, societal rules? Um, you know, overthrow things, or, or is it more like an inflected thing? I mean, just thinking about it, I would say it, it does sound like it's subversion to me. Although, uh, I did have a student who, now that I'm thinking about it, I remember reading an essay about Rage Against the Machine, and they made the point that, in a way, it's preferred, occluded, and their argument was that it's on a major record label, you know, and these the band is popular and they're making a lot of money with it. <laughs> uh, so they're kind of like capitalists in a sense. In re reality, they're kind of capitalists because they're making money from the CDs. Uh, even though the songs seem to be opposed to the system. I mean, that, that's kinda, I'm probably kind of butchering the argument a little bit there, but I think that was the, uh, the idea. And I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty clever, pretty brilliant, really. <laughs> you know, reading or analysis of uh, what the actual reading is pretty uh, pretty clever uh, okay anyway moving on uh, standpoints uh, so a standpoint you know a point of where you're standing right is in our understanding of the world as shaped by where we are situated within it our life experiences based on class gender race sexual identity and, and so on. So sort of where you're coming from, your point of view, uh, you know, are you working class, are you wealthy, part of the dominant class, etc. And the same across the spectrum here, gender, race, sexual identity, and so on. Uh, so we're saying these things really make a difference. All right, you're, the way you look at the world, you know, I mean, the way you understand things, not just a, a song or, you know, a work of pop culture, but like everything to some extent is affected not just by one of these, but you got to think about the whole package, right? And these will be a standpoint. So you can imagine how many different standpoints there are. I guess as many standpoints as there are uh, people, basically. Uh, however, the argument here is if your standpoint is within the dominant groups, you know, whichever one of these you want to talk about, uh, it could be a problem for you because uh, you might fail to see inequality and thus continue to perpetuate it. So you might be somebody who says, oh, I would never do that. You know, I'm, I'm totally committed to, you know, social justice and so on. But since you don't have the right, your standpoint is within the dominant group, uh, you might see a facade. So this is what's called a Potemkin uh, village here. So the story here is, I think it was uh, uh, Catherine the Second, maybe, of Tsarist uh, Russia. Uh, so I guess they had her in a, in a wagon, you know, going or a coach, carriage, making these tours. And you know, she'd look out her window there and see, like, facades. Oh, look, everybody's doing great. <laughs> it's a prosperous village here. Uh, when this was just kind of a, a facade, really what was going on was, you know, pretty horrific conditions uh, for the people. Uh, so this kind of metaphor, this is this kind of a metaphor for what we're talking about here. 
right? If you're in the carriage, you know, looking out the window, you might look out and say, oh, everything's fine. I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about inequality, right? <laughs> I don't see any inequality. <laughs> well, that's because you're part, you know, you're in the carriage, right? You're not really seeing things. You Maybe you can't really see it um, because you don't have, a, you know, your standpoint, again, is within the, the dominant uh, class. Okay, whew. <laughs> a lot of material here. Uh, okay, uh, there's four basic categories of feminist perspective uh, that Sal now identifies, and you know I'm sure we could probably add on like at least four, you know, 14, 40 more. <laughs> uh, it just seems to go on forever. Uh, but I think these four categories make a lot of sense, and it's, it's useful, I think, to divide, uh, or at least be thinking about sort of perspectives within a perspective. Uh, so just briefly, uh, a liberal feminist perspective uh, focuses on the inclusion of women in traditionally should be male-dominated areas. Uh, so, for example, uh, they used the, they talked about in the book how, I think it was police officer, and so you have police officers um, who are women, right? Women, uh, I guess it used to be, the word was like police man. <laughs> so that's an inaccurate term. We don't like this term because it kind of implies that there's, you know, that police should be men. Let's, let's do away with that word and have a police officer. And furthermore, let's make sure that there are actually, uh, you know, women in these uh, roles, right? So you don't just, you have these old movies where they're like all the police there's no uh, female officers represented in that movie. You know, the same for any doctors, lawyers, you know, you name it. Uh, if you're a liberal feminist perspective, uh, then you want to make sure that there's uh, not just all of one anything, right? You want to have a uh, diversity in those roles. You want it to be inclusive. And that's what you're focused on. Uh, the radical... Um, <coughs> radical... Uh, feminist assumes that inequities and oppression stem from how the system creates men and women differently, uh, subject and object, gender identities, and the values or lack of values associated with them. So you hear a lot these days about systemic issues, right? And saying it's not just a, a small group of people doing it. It's not like there's just a few uh, bad apples or something like this. Uh, the whole system is, is the problem, right? There's the way that um, uh, you know, people are taught or uh, conditioned to accept certain views, I suppose, on uh, gender identities, for example. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's got a lot in common, I suppose, with the, the liberal perspective. But this is kind of saying that the problem is bigger uh, than just a lack of representation in certain uh, areas. Uh, you know, the problem is across the whole board, and we really need to... Uh, be radical, radical change. I guess that's the key. Why well, it's called radical, right? We need radical change. Uh, and then the Marxist perspective. Again, this was kind of like a blend of the uh, neo-Marxist and the feminist perspective. I think I even mentioned um, when we were talking about that how you you talk about like a pay gap, wage, uh, was it the gender pay gap, uh, things of that sort, or just. Uh, you know, if people aren't making the same amount of money or there's not enough uh, CEOs, um, I guess it's kind of like the liberal perspective in, in that regard. Uh, but basically, you're just saying if the, if, the, you know, if the money's not equal, you know, if the economics don't work out equal, then how are you going to have any of these other kinds of uh, equality, right? you got to solve that problem first. Uh, and then the cultural uh, feminist perspective, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, so here we're talking about, well, what about those traditional feminine skills? You know, you got all these movies about, uh, oh, what was it? The uh, Kindergarten Cop, I think, was mentioned for some reason, or the Daddy Daycare. <laughs> I think they said Eddie Murphy in that. Uh, but, you know, they're saying, look, you got all these skills that are kind of a, traditionally associated with uh, women's work, you know, quote, unquote. Uh, maybe instead of just saying, well, those... You don't want to agree with the, uh, uh, the the sort of sexist views. This is well; those are just meaningless skills, or those aren't important skills, or something like that. Uh, a cultural feminist would say, you know, quite the opposite. You know, the problem is that they're just not not valued enough. Uh, so you might hear, for example, uh, that um, homemaker, 
for example, should be a paid position. Right? This is a you know, very important thing. Uh, it's not like it's uh, somehow worthless or less useful than being a lawyer, you know, whatever other profession this, uh, there are. Uh, we just don't value them as much as we should. That's what we said. That is my <laughs> quick and dirty <laughs> uh, description of these. You can certainly read the chapter if you want to dig in a little deeper. Okay, so how do you actually conduct a uh, feminist analysis? Well, obviously, you'd start by selecting an appropriate text. And, you know, at the start of this lecture, we looked at a particular scene from The Walking Dead where they're, you know, basically talking about gender roles. Uh, you know, so if you got a movie that's about you know, something to do with the sexuality or gender uh, relations between uh, genders and economics, or, you know, whatever the case may be, if there's something there, um, if that's kind of the focus of that scene or that song or that uh, movie, uh, that'd be pretty good material for you to analyze. Uh, so then you get into the examination part of it. So who are the characters in the scene or the show, whatever, and what are their subject positions? So the, the subject position, there's two kinds, models and, or anti-models. Remember, the model is the character that you want to be like. The anti-models are the ones depicted as being undesirable for some reason. And, you know, first of all, they have to have a, a subject position, meaning that they at least have enough power to make decisions for themselves. Uh, they're not objects. So the opposite of a subject position would be an object position, right? As somebody that's not empowered uh, to make any any sort of decision. Uh, so you're looking for uh, the models and anti-models. Um, B, examine who is empowered and disempowered. All right, so this kind of goes along with this one, right? So who gets to, um, you know, make, who's sort of at the top, who's on the bottom, who's uh, is free, who has freedom to make decisions, who has opportunities, who gets uh, rewarded for certain uh, behaviors and attitudes and actions uh, versus who gets disempowered or sort of, you know, if it's a movie, <laughs> if it's a show like The Walking Dead, <laughs> you know, who gets uh, eaten, All right? So if a character is acting a certain way and that seems to work out pretty well for them, uh, you say, well, that set of behaviors, the way they're acting must be pretty good. You know, they're sort of empowered uh, versus these other characters who are you know, starving to death or, again, literally being eaten by <laughs> the walkers. <laughs> That's pretty disempowering when you become a walker. Uh, you no longer have free will and you become a sort of shambling corpse looking to devour your friends and family. <laughs> pretty disempowering. <laughs> uh, see, examine whether the text supports or challenges patriarchy, uh, masculine hegemony, or heteronormativity. All right, so one thing might be, you know, is there a gay character? If there is, you know, you could say, well, let's look at this character. Is the character model or anti-model? Are they empowered or disempowered? Uh, do things work out pretty well for this character? Or do things go really badly uh, for this character? You know, you know, how does this all work out? And then once you had that, you could say, well, you know, the character was really strong, uh, really well respected in the show. Uh, a lot of people identified, you know, with the character. Uh, the character was, you know, a leader. Uh, you know, it really looks good in the show. <laughs> so you'd say that uh, does, that challenges uh, heteronormativity. You know, if on the other hand, the you know the character dies really quickly, or is depicted some as somehow weak, or you know whatever, some kind of negative depiction, you would say that does not challenge heteronormativity that and matter of fact it does the opposite it reinforces it all right and then the third item here evaluating potential implications uh, so this is kind of what they call the so what question you know, so what if it does this uh, what does that mean for society you know if people watch the show and they see these values and they embrace these values is that going to be good or bad for society at large of course that's <laughs> where your argument comes in you, know, you have a position all right, so let's wrap it up then. Uh, uh, so reread, if you haven't read already, those sample essays at the end of the chapter. You don't have to do both, but just, just pick one. Uh, there's one on the Hunger Games, and there's one on the Devil Wears uh, Prada. At least I hope that's how you pronounce that. Uh, then answer this question. So consider the arguments that essay makes and whether or not you agree. What implications do you see regarding films sending these kinds of messages about the roles and rules for women and men in society? 
In other words, what are those potential implications that we talked about? Uh, so take a look at that essay and write about 100 or so words, and then uh, come back and we'll finish up. All right, so I hope you folks enjoyed this, found it helpful. Um, we'll stop here, but again, as always, I really like to read your uh, comments, questions. So if you have a question, a comment, anything you'd like to say, please do so, and I will see you next time.